So welcome everybody. Uh, the second presentation of this afternoon session will be linked to uh, ethylene oxide sterilization and a failure that you might have and then never expect, but that may occur is a positive BI. What do you do with a positive BI when you have a routine sterilization? How can you deal with that? And I'll try to, to go through uh, the kind of investigation that we can do. Just a quick, quick word about myself. So I have uh, joined Sterogenics 16 years ago. My background is uh, uh, chemical engineering. So I am not a microbiologist and you will notice that in my presentation. Uh, and I'm mainly leading uh, sterilization uh, activities. So uh, cycle validation, cycle design, cycle development. Uh, both mainly in gas sterilization, but also uh, recently I also now supervising uh, radiation uh, projects. And uh, I am an active member of the ISO committee, the working group one of the TC198, which uh, is leading the EO sterilization activities and we are currently rewriting the standards. So it's keeping me busy uh, when I'm not doing these validation activities. So what will be covered in the presentation today? Uh, I'll start basically with uh, the, the wh wh what is my sample? Wh what is a PCD? Wh wh what is a BI? Wh how uh, can these uh, be uh, considered? Then what will be the first immediate action that we will be doing in case of uh, uh, that, that kind of issue? Then investigation is key and essential. And when you do an investigation, you expect to find a root cause, hopefully. So what would be the impact that it might have uh, on the device, on the loads, on the long-term uh, situation? Uh, what, as, what is the outcome of such investigation? And who is responsible for what? Because it's key and essential to define who is responsible for what uh, in, that, uh, in that field. And I will start uh, also giving you some uh, advices on how to, how to minimize the likelihood of these uh, positive BIs, uh, as well as minimizing the impact of these positive BIs that can, they can have on, the, on your devices. So I'll start first with a PCD. PCD is an acronym that's standing for Process Challenge Device, and it may just be a biological indicator that is used in EO sterilization containing a million spores of Bacillus atrophius. But mainly we are uh, creating an artificial increased resistance with a PCD, uh, which is giving a higher resistance than the product. So we can use PCD, but PCD can be both uh, internal PCD, so that can be a device containing uh, a sport uh, a carrier, such as a biological indicator on a paper strip, uh, on a liquid suspension, uh, and this uh, internal BI is used during validation to define the minimum uh, time that is required and the minimum specification that are required to uh, reach the sterility adherence level that we target. But there are also external PCD and external PCD is the one that uh, is being used routinely. So we don't want to open boxes uh, when you, we, ha we have routine sterilization in order to, to minimize the damage it can cause to the, to the devices. So uh, here, the focus of that presentation is the second case failure in case of external PCD. So mainly used in routine. So <coughs> I have a positive BI and it, it, may, it may happen, but what is the first reaction that uh, is needed? Don't go into panic mode, it's not necessary, it will never be helpful. The first thing that you need to think about is, of course, obviously isolate the load and making sure that this load cannot be sold as sterile because it's probably having an issue. So the, the isolation and quarantine of the, the load is really the first action. And then we need to define who uh, to contact. So we need to contact the sponsor and let um, the, the sponsor know that there is an issue and that the load might not be released. So that's uh, really critical that is happening instantaneously, so we cannot wait a day for, for communicating that. It has to be uh, proactively communicated once the lab is uh, uh, informing us about this, uh, this outcome. So, uh, of course, the first basic stuff that needs to be done is making sure that we have a true positive. So we have to identify the growth that we obtain. Uh, and if we have a really good uh, likelihood that it's a true positive, then we can start investigation. If it's a false negative, it can happen. Lab contamination is not something that we do because at Nelson Labs we are the best in the world, so we don't do that. But it may happen that sometimes uh, 
uh, yeah, uh, an, an external issue may happen in the laboratory. So we are not uh, always bulletproof for that. It can happen. So if we have a false positive, then we have internal procedure to deal with that. So we basically explain that it was an external contamination, and then we can invalidate the test results. So basically, we, we can just inform the um, the customer that we we had an issue, but it ha it, it has been uh, solved by itself. I would say. But really, isolation of the load is key and essential, making sure that, uh, because we, we have, in some cases, uh, customers that are picking up the load before final release, so uh, be to speed up the, the release to market, so they may already have the load in their premises, waiting the certificate of uh, biological indicator. So it means that if we are not informing them, the likelihood to have the load being distributed uh, is quite important. So that's why we need to make sure that this kind of communication is going straight forward to the customer and that there is a way to uh, have a proper isolation and, and quarantine of the load. So how do we start investigation? Uh, investigation is not a single person because it will be involving uh, equipment, it will be involving people, laboratory, uh, all stakeholders that are playing a role needs to be part of the team. So it's going to be a cross-functional team that will be uh, investigating. And of course, each team member should be competent for what he's reviewing. So it, mean, it means that uh, if we are uh, asking somebody from the lab to be uh, helping for the uh, investigation, it needs to be a trained person, obviously. And here, it is really important. Of course, it is not a pleasant news to, to tell uh, to the sponsors and customers, but we are helping them uh, as a partnership. So we are working with them to solve the issue and we are collaborating together to make sure that we can really get away from, from this issue. So it's really not just uh, from, from the customer side, you may not only expect uh, the contract uh, sterilizer to, to perform this on its own, but vice versa, we also need your support as a manufacturer to make sure that any change in the process or in the loading configuration uh, was not effective. So basically we need to, to uh, review all together and making sure that we can have a good decision-making tool so that we know that once we fix this issue, it will not happen again. So that's, that's really key and essential to go in deepness when we do the review and analysis of this uh, uh, kind of uh, failure that we occur, that, that can occur. So what are the typical, uh, and I'm not a quality person, so this Ishikawa uh, fishbone analysis is not my favorite stuff uh, uh, to deal with, but it's really a powerful tool that can uh, give really, uh, put the finger, to help really to put the finger on the real root cause. So obviously we could have either process. Process may have gone wrong. It might be the process that could be the issue or the equipment itself. Maybe we have an issue that the chamber uh, is not heating properly or we have an issue with the, with the supply of the steriliz sterilization agent. Obviously when there is an issue, personal is always a, a big uh, step because uh, human beings tend, uh, tend to make some mistakes from time to time. So it's of course making sure that we uh, know uh, if anybody has seen anything different uh, compared to normal is also key and essential. Uh, I mentioned material, so if we uh, have made a small changes at customer sites, it may in their view um, uh, have no impact, uh, but it might be changing completely the, the, <coughs> the, the, the story. And uh, about story, I'm going to tell you just a small story that happened uh, probably 10, 12 years ago, one of my customers uh, was a really small company selling products in the Benelux, only three countries, and uh, suddenly uh, a big, com big company found this product really, really interesting and decided to purchase the, the, the small customer. Suddenly they were selling no longer three countries, but 60 countries. So what happened is that IFU was coming from three pages to 60 pages. And they consider that as negligible because they are not changing the device. They didn't change the packaging uh, on, on itself, so they just did the change without informing us. And what happened, the first routine that we have, we have positive BI, so how can it be? Uh, so in first invest inv investigation, he said, I didn't change anything, but really interviewing the, the people, well, just the IFU, but you have to know that the paper is absorbing gas. So ethylene oxide was really sucked by the IFU and we were not using gas 
to the enough gas to, to sterilize. So basically, we were sterilizing the IFU, but not the, the, the BI that were placed outside the load. So that's one of the small changes that may not seem significant that could be really significant. Uh, the, the gas itself, we, we might have an issue with the quality of the gas, with the supply of the gas, so uh, that's also something that we need to check and to, to, to consider. Obviously, it's easy for me to blame BI because biological indicators are manufactured, so the, the, the quality and stability and the, the homogeneity of them might be questionable from time to time because you, you might find yourself at, at the end of a, of a process with a higher population or smaller population, so we can have fluctuation in the quality of these BIs. And they are also uh, prone to uh, desiccation. To when they are exposed to extreme conditions, they might become more resistant. So that's of course something to consider. Uh, so and obviously the laboratory is the last piece uh, that, that will be uh, inspected because we need to make sure that there is no source of external contamination. We need to check the environmental quality. Uh, all uh, daily check that we do in the laboratory to make sure that we are don't have a source of contamination in the lab. One of the good examples, what could be a contamination? Because you think contamination, then it may lead to a false positive because it's not going to be bacillus atrophius. But when we do incubate a validation load on which we expect growth, so it means that we will have some bacillus atrophius around, then if we use the same laminar hood to do the next testing, there might be a, <coughs> yeah, a, a, a leftover from the previous testing that could be uh, the, the root cause for the failure. So and in this case, it's really pretty hard to invalidate because it's going to be the same strain. So we cannot say, well, it's because we, I, I had the validation before. It might be true, but with a, then it ha has to be considered as a true positive. So that's uh, unfortunately uh, things that can happen, but we can prevent this to happen. So uh, isolate and quarantine lamina hood where validation was tested and not use it for routine is something that is done routinely as well. I'll start first with, uh, with the process. So uh, we have multiple questions that we can ask ourselves. Ethylene oxide sterilization is not using a single parameter. We have critical parameters. Uh, of course, the gas itself is, is important, but the temperature is important because we need uh, the ethylene oxide is working on the bacteria um, by alkylation. So it's forming a chemical reaction with the DNA uh, and the proteins from the, from the cells. Um, and this chemical reaction is also de the temperature dependent. So the higher we can go in temperature, the faster it will go. So it means that if we lower lower temperature, then it can decrease the, the efficiency of the gas. Uh, a 10 degree increase can have a factor two difference in terms of efficiency. So that's quite, uh, quite important. Uh, humidity is also a critical factor. So uh, uh, I'm talking about relative humidity, so always in steam state. Uh, for two reasons, uh, humidity is needed. We need uh, humidity because it's uh, acting as a catalyst for the alkylation reaction. To, uh, it's helping the EO to, to react, but it's also preventing the, the BIs or any spore forming uh, bacteria to become this, uh, dried out and become more resistant. So that's uh, really needed to have uh, humidity as well. Um, so these are really the critical parameters. But the first thing, obviously, that we need to check is I have a specification sheet that was validated, and uh, I need to check whether this uh, uh, cycle was conformed to the specification. So that's really the obvious first part, because if we have failures and a cycle non-conforming, then we know that it's the cycle, the, the root cause. The, the gas quantity that was injected in the chamber is also the second element that would probably be the most critical, because if we have, uh, we can, and we are doing performing trend analysis, so if we see that we have an outlier using l much less gas, we may have an explanation. It might be because there was a syst uh, an issue in the system of injection of the gas, or that the load was different and not absorbing the same way as before. So it is a good, uh, a good factor that uh, can be used and drive the, the uh, directly towards the conclusion because I think the, the, the gas weight is really one of the critical uh, elements. So whether it's injection or absorption, we, we may discover that uh, we have an issue there. And the last one, as I said, temperature is critical. So uh, 
Uh, typically, the EO chambers, they can be rather small, one chamber, but it can be huge. We can sterilize trucks, uh, 32 pallet chamber in one go. And we have different channels that are heating uh, independently from, from each other. So we may, we may have an issue with one of the channels, maybe a leak. And if we see that there is a specific spot uh, that is a bit co cooler, we may have to make the link between that cold spot and the location of the positive uh, BI that was retrieved. Second aspect to consider is the equipment. Of course, we need to check if uh, the, there was any maintenance or repair in the chamber that uh, could change the, 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 the behavior. And we are performing engineering test cycle just to make sure that uh, what has been done since ever is also obtained and that the parameters delivered are the same. So that's really basically the, uh, the way to, uh, to check if the equipment is still operating the same way. So basically, we are repeating uh, tests that are performed in qualification, operational qualification, so that we are sure that what has been done initially is still uh, performed and delivered. The third uh, aspect to consider is the, the personal. Of course, we need to make sure that the people that have been uh, touching the, the load are uh, trained properly, that we have training records to show that uh, we need to interview them because they might also just tell us, well, typically this load is coming without shrink wrap and we have three layers of shrink wrap. Uh, normally, it should have been stopped already, but at least we have an explanation in case of, uh, of failure. Uh, but really, um, we ask them also to, to take pictures from the load to see if there is any evidence that something has been changing uh, because a uh, picture is worth a thousand words and that's better to, to, to know that potentially something uh, uh, has been changed. There is also a uh, position of the BIs is important. We are talking about uh, external BIs, so it has to be placed outside of the load, so not inside the box, but there might be that sometimes if you have shrink wrap, that it can be placed on top of the shrink wrap or underneath the shrink wrap. And then the humidity condition will probably be completely different because you can dry out externally. Uh, so, of, of course, the location is also something that has to be, uh, to be considered. The fourth uh, pillar that we are going to, to check is the material itself. So um, the, the, the wrapping, so typically the, the products are being uh, sent to sterilization in boxes and in order to, to make them stable on a, on a pallet, uh, we are using stretch wrap or different, uh, different stuff. But we need to check if, the, if it's the same stretch wrap that has been used, the same amount of layers has been used as uh, com compared to the validation. Uh, if the, um, yeah, the, the, the material itself, is the film is not thicker than it used to be before, so that's wrapping is the first element. But for me, the most important here is the load. So if the configuration uh, is different uh, compared to what was validated, we may have an explanation why it's not working. Uh, the, the, the size of the load, we uh, <coughs> may have a, a, a load that is uh, larger than what was validated or smaller than what was validated, so it may have an impact also on the gas absorption. And the density is a key factor because the, uh, the, the more dense the load will be, the more time it will take to heat it up. So that's why it, it is also something that has to be considered. Then about the, the load content, we have to check with the sponsor that uh, we have the same devices, that no, no new device have been introduced without information, uh, that there is no, no change. Uh, we have the same for the boxes itself because uh, a cargo boxes is looking like a cargo boxes, but they may have different thickness, different absorption. So we, we when we have, a, uh, I would say, one of our customers that is changing boxes, uh, it's not just good to say, well, they are looking like the same or uh, my supplier is saying that it's the same. We need to perform some testing. So water absorption, uh, permeability to air and stuff like this, that we can show uh, definitely that it's fully equivalent. And maybe we have also customers that are using, uh, which is a really, really bad idea, a dunnage load as part of the routine shipment because they are not having enough uh, devices to fill the chambers. So they are using a dummy pallet just to fill the chamber uh, to have the, the load validated. But you need to know that uh, re reprocessing a pallet on and on and on is changing the absorption properties of the cardboard. So you may have less absorption in the cardboard boxes 
and we have identified why. So we have, do, do, we have been doing some testing, and ethylene oxide can be transformed into ethylene glycol in presence of water. And uh, after reprocessing on and on and on, we are detecting a l high peaks of ethylene glycol in the, in, in the layers of the corrugated boxes. So it means that this uh, ethylene glycol is becoming a protective barrier and really is uh, not allowing EO and humidity to be absorbed the same way. So it's important to try to go away uh, from the utilization of a drainage load in, in routine and to validate rather a minimum load with less product in the chamber. But uh, uh, yeah, I would say the quality over time of a drainage load may degrade and may change the conditions of the, of the sterilization cycle. One easy check is the ethylene oxides. Uh, so we can there with GC testing uh, confirm the purity of the, the EO that we, we are using. It's a basic test that can be uh, performed. So that's uh, something that needs to be considered. But we need also to check whether there was some alarms or if the we have been injecting really gaseous EO. EO is liquid when we receive it. It's pressurized and going through a vaporizer. But it may be that we have liquid EO, and liquid EO is not sterilizing. So basically, we need to check this. Uh, in most of uh, the chamber sterilization chamber, because uh, ethylene oxide is denser than air, so if you are not forcing recirculation, it will naturally drop to the bottom of the, of the loads. So we are using uh, a blower to have recirculation. So we need to make sure that the blower is also working properly so that there is no, no issue at all. And uh, biological indicator is, of course, something to consider. So did we change BI type, BI lots? Was the PCD used really built according to the procedure? Uh, one uh, of the important aspects here is the storage condition because BIs are uh, supplied with conditions of storage. It, they need to be stored typically between 15 and 25 degrees with certain amount of humidity. So if they are being placed on the loads, I don't know, three, four days before, they are completely outside the control conditions. And we may have extreme conditions during these days. So it might be... Uh, not in Germany, but it might be if you are sterilizing uh, in Texas or in China that it's 50 degrees outside and then you can dry out the BIs. Or it might be that uh, in Finland you have minus uh, 25 outside and then the BI is becoming more resistant. So outside the control conditions, the BI may behave completely differently. So that's why it's important to make sure that storage and conditions are under control. And we have, uh, within our network, uh, at Sterogenics and Nelson Labs, a centralized database uh, where we can track all batches that are giving unexpected results so that we can point the finger, yeah, okay, it's again that batch of BI that is causing issues, so then we can isolate and quarantine and remove the, the batch of BI that is being used because it may be that yeah, processing and manufacturing conditions may be, may be different. And as I said, if we, we have to make sure that we know and we have traceability uh, which position has been showing growth uh, so that we can trace it back with the, the palette, the location, and the conditions around this palette. And the last uh, element to consider is the laboratory itself. So did we incubate the BI in the right conditions, right media, right temperature? Uh, was aseptic conditions being met throughout the testing, so we need to interview the people that they have uh, done the testing. And from some of them, if we see potential issues, we need to retrain them and restart acc uh, accreditation for some testing. Uh, of course, we have to check the quality of our HEPA filter in the laminar flow, so that making sure that uh, if we have some issues that we, we are not uh, having some spores flying around in the in that uh, in the laminar hoods, and uh, we are doing daily check about environmental conditions to make sure that there is no contamination in the laboratory. Once we have gathered all of that information, that's binary. Either we have a root cause or we don't. So, so what do we do if we have a root cause assigned? Uh, well, that, that's basically we have procedures uh, when we have a root cause assigned. Uh, we need to take the right approach in collaboration with the customer, with the different stakeholders. 
So, um, and we need, of course, li like GMP rules, what is not written is not existing. We need to document it uh, properly. So making sure that when we have a full inv investigation report that we have uh, uh, recorded on paper or electronically all the different uh, things that have been uh, identified. And we need to, to check if uh, we have a potential unique root cause or cumulative root cause, because we might be on the edge with the temperature of storage, we might be on the edge with the temperature of processing, and these two together can lead to an issue. So it might not be a single root cause that, uh, that can be attributed to a failure. Uh, and what is also helpful, um, like you, you mentioned, trending and review what has been done before, you, you, we need to make sure that we are not finding any drift or uh, any outlier in the distribution. <coughs> Unfortunately, and that's most of the time uh, the case because not, that's not uh, always easy. Uh, as the processes are really under control, equipment is also well maintained, uh, manufacturers know what they do and don't know that the change may have uh, some uh, negative impact on the process. Uh, it may uh, be that we are not finding any root cause, that we cannot assign any root cause. So uh, that's of course pr an issue with microbiology. We're talking here about living organisms, so they might behave like human beings differently. Uh, you, you may yourself find doing the same stuff on and on and on, and then suddenly one day you do differently. Uh, it may not be a success. I'm just thinking about a recipe that I've been trying re recently, and it was a, a mess. So I'm not, uh, but it might be the, 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 the same with uh, microbiological uh, elements. Um, so we, we could also have some stuff that we think uh, have happened, but we cannot prove. So we have some uh, BIs that are placed in PCD in tubing, and you might have kinking. So the, the access to the gas is being blocked because we pull vacuum. There may, may, might be something. We, we can't believe it's that, but we cannot prove it because we cannot make pictures during the cycle. So there uh, it's hard to, to really put, put the finger on that root cause, but we cannot find, we cannot assign it. Even if we believe, we, we have no proof. So uh, th then, uh, of course, again, we need to document uh, to perform trend analysis and uh, to see what would be then the impact. And in terms of uh, impact, uh, I mentioned initially we need to isolate the load and making sure, but uh, it might be that the load, because there was an urgent uh, delivery, it has already gone to the, to, to the hospital. So making sure that we have no product that's being used on the patient, and if it's the case, then have a recall and making sure that we have a really uh, a complete deep analysis, making sure that there is no issue at all. But most of the time, we can prevent this um, because the, the load will, will not be physically released until we have the, the certificate. So normally, it should not happen. But we have to check if that it, it has not been happening. Um, we need now to check if the failure itself could have an impact on the validation. Can we question the validation? Were we just lucky during the validation? or? Uh, is it not related and the cycle is robust enough. So that's also something that uh, uh, we need to make sure. And then we need to check if really, uh, if we are really on the edge and find out that the cycle is a bit borderline, we need to check if we had been lucky, we, we have been lucky before and it might be some, some issues and loads that could have been unsterile or really on the edge that are on the market. Typically we try to validate more uh, resistant uh, PCD than product, so this event of uh, unsterile product is really extremely low. And then once we have uh, identified or not root cause, we need to make sure that we uh, assess the impact on the future loads. So uh, shall I stop using that chamber? Sh shall I stop using the, these loads for sterilization? So that's all the questions that need to be answered. Uh, of course, value of the product is commercially something that you need to uh, to think about because uh, if you are not validating reprocessing and the, the, the possibility to restoreize a, a, a load, then you lose it basically. So if the cost is high, then it's maybe worth investing in validating two times or three times exposure rather than having a risk to, to, to lose completely a load. And of course, uh, it, it is for me really good practice to inform authorities uh, about this. So I had a failure in my routine cycle. We have a root cause uh, and at least be transparent with them. So not hiding anything. In terms of the, the outcomes, I, I would say the easiest one, if you have validated reprocessing or restorization, then you just reprocess it and 
if there's of course no root cause uh, assigned uh, and it was just pure bad luck, then you can reprocess it without any concern. Uh, or unfortunately, you may have to scrap the load if it's not reprocessable. Uh, or if it's really putting the validation into questions, uh, then th th there is no way, uh, no other way than doing a full validation again. So revalidate full fully again. Uh, it's in red. It's in the middle of the of the of the page. But I know there are a lot of creative minds in the in the field. But it is written black on white here, red on white. But in the standard black on white, that uh, it is not possible to release a load on which we had a positive BI. So you cannot do product stability testing because how many products uh, shall you test to validate uh, a SAL of 10 minus 6? One in a million, you need to test a million products. So nobody will, even if we like to, uh, we like to do business with customer, nobody will accept in our lab laboratory to do uh, testing on a million devices. So how to minimize the likelihood of, uh, of a positive BI? So obviously, as I said, having the BIs under control is key. Making sure that when we prepare the load, we prepare, we put the BI last minute, just before starting the process, and not w days before. Uh, and we need to track the conditions in which the BIs are stored. So it's mandatory to have the temperature and humidity being controlled because uh, even if we have a room uh, that is set at certain conditions, if we are not tracking it, we don't know what were the conditions. Uh, it, it is obvious we need to validate external PCD that are more resistant because we use them in routine, so they are external, it's easy to place and to retrieve compared to opening boxes, but we might uh, have sometimes PCD that are completely extremely crazy uh, resistant and uh, there it can lead to real failures because they are too resistant, so it's really good advice to select PCD that are not completely uh, outside the resistance of the, of the product itself. Uh, we may so typically we claim a sterility assurance level of 10 minus 6, so 1 in a million. We start with BIs that have a population of 10 to the 6, and uh, we need uh, to so the, the d value is the time needed to reduce the population by a factor 10. So we need to have time to devalue uh, to have the sterility assurance level uh, validated. But it may be good practice not to use just 12, maybe, maybe 16, 18, just to not to be on the edge. So, so validate the SL that will be lower than 10 minus 6 is also good practice. If we think about the true bio burden in EO validation, most of the time we are at 10 minus 20, 10 minus 30. So that there's, it's really quite conservative. Uh, but at least for the PCD, it might not be as low in terms of risk to fail. And that's my preferred one, because I'm not a microbiologist, I told you. The best for me is to validate parametric lease. Parametric lease, we no longer use BI, we just check the parameters, and we can release the load without having BI incubation, which is my favorite, because I trust more calibration of a device than a living microorganism. But yeah, I may be wrong, but that's my personal opinion about it. So how to minimize then the impact? Uh, obviously, uh, for, for me, uh, validating the, the products to be reprocessed uh, at least a second time is really the key. And what does it mean? Uh, it's not just that you put them twice and that's okay. You need to assess packaging, cytotox, biocomp after two processing because uh, EO is toxic with, with the cells. So if you have a higher content of EO in the product after sterilization, you may still pass the 10993-7 limits but it may have an impact on the 1093-5 uh, uh, data. So you need maybe to think about doing this validation upfront. When you start the activities, really have a partnership with the, with the contract manufacturer, but uh, with your contract supplier and the lab laboratory as well to make sure that we ha has, uh, and this is why Nelson and Sterogenics are presenting together. We, we can help you to find the best solution to validate two times sterilization and covering and checking all the boxes that you need to do when you do such a, such a stuff. So obviously, uh, you probably have to, uh, for contingency reason, have to validate the cycle in different chambers because if during the investigation we find out that it's an equipment failure, then we need to uh, have it repaired, refixed, re revalidated completely. It, it may take, I don't know, one, two weeks, and you may have uh, urgent product that cannot wait for one, two weeks. So that's why if you have a second backup chamber qualified, then at least you can shift the, the product on the second chamber. 
In terms of uh, contingency, uh, it's even better to have two sites validated. You could uh, have a bigger issue in one site and having to shut down for whatever reason. Then you can switch to the other site and have still business continuity. And for me, the, the last one is obvious, selecting a good partner uh, for as a, as a contract sterilization company is really the, the, the best you can do because it's just not about, <coughs> I have a positive BI, I send an email to the customer and that's it. No, that's not what we do. We, what we are doing, we are helping them to find a solution and it's just a partnership. And that's why it's important also to, to start yeah, when everything is fine, everything is fine. But when, it, when, when we have a deep issue, then we can solve it together and learn from it and improve it over time. So that's really key to have that uh, as well covered. Just to remind also uh, everybody, even if contract sterilization uh, is responsible to maintain the equipment, to have calibration, uh, they are not putting the goods on the market. So the manufacturer remains responsible for the decisions that are being taken. A uh, contract manufacturer um, is responsible for packaging, for, for all the steps, including releasing the loads on the market. So that's why we can help you to prevent to release things that should not be released, but we are not responsible for that. So uh, as, a, as a customer, you, you keep the responsibility. So yeah, of course, it can happen. Positive BI is something that's the likelihood is really low. I would say on a yearly basis, we can record probably five, six positive BIs throughout the network without any explanation. It can happen. It's not huge failure, but we validate uh, one in a million failures. So if we consider overall, we incubate more than millions of BIs on a yearly basis. Uh, so it theoretically, just statistically, it can happen. That's something that we cannot prevent uh, to, to happen. Uh, but we can minimize the likelihood or the occurrence uh, if we are validating that properly, if we are taking good actions. And finally, just after this, tra the, the, this uh, training session, just be prepared for that. N be prepared and be trained on how to react when it's, uh, when it's occurring. Because you know that, uh, of course, it's going to be panic, it's going to be not nice, but it's not the end of the world. You, we may come out of it with a more robust cycle with a better uh, solution and solving the issue uh, as a partner. And I want to thank you for uh, listening to this presentation and I would be happy to take any questions.